Ave Maria. Welcome to the History Program, a monthly series of programs produced by the Franciscans of the Immaculate for Gate of Heaven Radio. In this series, we will be looking at events in history, famous people in history, including saints and blesseds, foundations of religious orders, and much more. In short, anything in history that has a Catholic perspective. Our objective will be to tell you the facts as recorded by history. We will not be entering into polemics nor aiming to generate any controversy. If we venture an opinion, we will say so. You are free to agree or disagree. This month's programme is entitled Glendalough, Glory of Irish Monasticism, Part 2. In part one of this programme, we spoke about the beginnings of Glendalough Monastery, as well as, as well as the life of its founder and first abbot, St. Kevin. In tonight's programme, we will examine some of the later buildings and have a look at the life of one of its last and most famous abbots. Glendalough became a diocese in the years following St. Kevin's death. And in many cases, the abbot of Glendalough would also be ordained Bishop of Glendalough. The largest of the seven churches of Glendalough is the Cathedral Church, still in imposing ruins today. The cathedral was dedicated to St. Peter and Paul. Reverend Sir John O'Connell, in his booklet, Glendalough, Its Story and Its Ruins, says that it probably dates from the 7th century. The nave measures about 49 feet by 30 feet and the chancel measures about 38 feet by 22 feet. The eastern window of this chancel seems to have been beautifully sculptured, but alas, no trace of the work remains today. However, old drawings show us two legends of St. Kevin that had been commemorated in the window sculpture. Father O'Connell takes up the story. One of the stories relates that a young man, a relative of St. Kevin, fell grievously ill. He yearned for an apple, which he declared was the only food which could cure him. In the stern valley of the two lakes, no apples ever grew. But the saint, having prayed, put forth his hand and plucked some fruit from off a willow tree and gave it to the young man who, having eaten it, was at once restored to health. The other legend relates that St. Kevin was praying one day at the retreat church with arms outstretched when a blackbird came and dropped her eggs into his open palm. Rather than disturb the bird, the gentle-hearted saint kept his arms extended and his hands open until the eggs were hatched. In religious symbolism, St. Kevin is, therefore, usually depicted holding a blackbird's nest. He is also represented with a harp, as it is recorded that he was highly skilled in the use of this instrument. St. Peter and Paul Cathedral was the cathedral church of the Bishop of Glendalough until 1214 AD, at which time the see was united to the Archdiocese of Dublin. There can also be seen the ruins of yet another church, a church known as the Priest's House. Little seems to be known of the origin of this building. Father O'Connell tells us that the most interesting feature now existing in this church is the shattered fragment of the famous pediment over the doorway representing a bishop, but possibly St. Kevin, seated between a bishop or an abbot holding a crozier and a bell ringer. The Irish scholar George Petrie points out that this fragment is of great interest in fixing the date of the church. The crozier held by the abbot is of the form of the simple shepherd's crook as found in all the existing croziers of the primitive saints of the Irish church and which was certainly not later than the 12th century. 
the quadrangular shaped bell also exhibits the primitive form of consecrated bells. But still more important is the shape of the low mitre of the saint, the ornament on which is similar to that found on the sculptured figure of Saint Ledger, dated from about the 7th century. We need to make brief mention of three other interesting features found in the grounds of Glendalough. Although the walls of the ancient monastic city of Glendalough have for the most part disappeared, the gateway which formed the north entrance to the city still remains. This gateway is the only surviving example of an entrance to a primitive ecclesiastical settlement in Ireland. The gateway is double, having two arches, and originally supported a tower. The stones making up the arches were cut specifically to scale and held themselves up without any need for mortar, which surely was a great engineering feat for its day. Close to the priest's house lies a Celtic cross known as St Kevin's Cross. This cross is carved from a single granite stone and stands about eight feet high. The cross may have marked the boundary of the cemetery in which stands the priest's house. To the east of the upper lake lie the remains of a stone enclosure or ring fort known as a cair. The cair is about 66 feet in diameter. Scholars differ as to the origins of this fort. Some say that it may have been used as a meeting place or shelter for pilgrims. We have left to last the most famous and striking feature of Glendalough. We speak of the round tower. The tower stands just over 100 feet tall and is one of, the, one of the finest examples of an Irish round tower in existence. The top story has four square-headed windows and each of the five stories above the door has one light each being alternatively directed to a different point on the compass. It is appropriate at this juncture to look at round towers in general and see what their purpose may have been. It appears that the principal use of the round tower was that of a belfry. Father O'Connell tells us that this opinion is strengthened by two facts. Firstly, the word for round tower in the Irish language is click hioc, which literally means bell house. The bell would have been rung at morning and evening to call the people in the surrounding countryside to prayer. Secondly, bells of considerable power and size were not unknown in that period. St. Patrick himself was wont to distribute bells to the churches he founded. And indeed, bells have been found from that period, the pinning of which could be heard for several miles around. However, the round towers certainly served another use during the times of invasion from marauding bands. The sacred vessels and the church treasures could be gathered and placed for safety in the almost impregnable towers. Chief amongst these marauding bands were the Danes, also known as the Vikings or the Norsemen. It would take several programmes to discuss in detail the Danish invasion of Ireland, but we should say something general about it. Around the close of the 8th century, bands of Danes began making raids along the coast of Ireland, selling in on their famous or their infamous Viking longships. It has to be said that these bands were barbarian in their lifestyle and behaviour. All who got in their way were put to death. Monasteries and churches were burned and the sacred vessels and the church treasures were looted. The round towers we just spoke of 
were used to store such sacred contents in advance of raids, thus keeping them safe from the Danes. Viking settlements eventually began making inroads along the coastal towns, particularly the east coast and especially Dublin. This continued throughout the 9th and the 10th centuries. Happily, the tide began to turn against the Danes in 1014, when they were defeated by the Irish forces led by the High King, Brian Boru, at the famous Battle of Clontarf. These Danish invaders were pagan, and they worshipped their own pagan Norse gods. However, as the years went by, many of their number eventually began to embrace Christianity. The very first Danish Bishop of Dublin was Donatus. He was consecrated by the Archbishop of Canterbury, as were many of his successors. It is time now to have a look at one of the last, and certainly one of the most illustrious, of the abbots of Glendalough. We speak of St. Lawrence O'Toole. Lorcan, or in the English language Lawrence O'Toole, was born of noble stock around the year 1132. Whilst still a young boy, Lawrence's family were forced to place him in the hands of their overlord, Jermit McMurrah, the King of Leinster, as a hostage. Such a thing was not at all unusual in those days. Young Lawrence was treated with the utmost cruelty by McMurrah. Following threats from the O'Toole family, who had taken captive 12 of McMurrah's followers, the King agreed to release young Lawrence into the hands of the Bishop of Glendalough. Young Lawrence was placed in the school of Glendalough, where he excelled as a student. Lawrence was already a student there for 13 years when the abbot died. The voice of the clergy and the people were unanimous in proclaiming Lawrence as abbot. And so at the early age of 25 years, he was placed as the at the head of this great monastery. He became known for his wisdom and prudence in governing the monastery and for his charity to the poor. In 1160, not long after Lawrence became abbot, the Bishop of Glendalough died. Again, the populace clamoured for Lawrence to fill a vacancy, this time to the see of Glendalough. However, Lawrence refused to allow himself to be nominated. In the following year, 1161, the Archbishop of Dublin died. Actually, he had been the very first Archbishop of Dublin, as the diocese had by that stage been raised to the status of an archdiocese. This time, Abbot Lawrence could not escape the call to fill the vacancy. The following year, Lawrence was consecrated Archbishop of Dublin in Christ Church Cathedral by Archbishop Galasius, the Primate of Ireland and Archbishop of Armagh. We should mention in passing that Christ Church Cathedral still stands today. It has been officially designated the seat of the Archbishops of Dublin since the time of St. Lawrence O'Toole, but since the Protestant revolt of the 16th century, the cathedral has been used by the Protestant Church of Ireland. St. Mary's Pro Cathedral in Dublin was built by the Catholic Church in the early 19th century to serve as a pro cathedral or acting cathedral in the meantime. Generations of Dubliners have since referred to it as the pro cathedral. Anyway, back to the consecration of Lawrence O'Toole. At that time, many of the citizens of Dublin would have been of Danish origin. Up till then, only foreigners subject to the approbation of the Archbishop of Canterbury had been selected as bishop. Lawrence was Irish-born and Irish-educated. He was consecrated by the Primate of Ireland without any prior approval 
of the Archbishop of Canterbury, and this was a welcome change from previous practice. Archbishop Lawrence began a series of reforms, especially with the clergy. He induced the clergy to adopt the rule of life of the Canons Regular of St. Augustine, and he lived with them in community. Archbishop Lawrence gave a holy example to both clergy and people alike, especially of his austerity and piety. In making his retreats, he would return to his beloved Glendalough. An important landmark in Irish history was the Norman invasion, which had its beginnings in 1169. We do not have enough time in this programme to discuss this invasion in detail, but we do need to say a little background about it. In 1166, the King of Leinster, Dermot MacMurray, was deposed by the High King of Ireland. Incidentally, this is the same MacMurray who took a hostage of Archbishop Lawrence as a young boy. MacMurray went to seek help from Henry II, the King of England, in order to recover his throne. Henry was sympathetic. Initially, forces under the command of Norman lords were sent over to Ireland. The Normans invaded Dublin in 1169, but Archbishop Lawrence encouraged the citizens in their defence of the city, and the invaders withdrew. The following year, 1170, the Normans invaded for a second time, this time with greater success, especially with the arrival of Richard de Clare, better known as Strongbow. Archbishop Lawrence was sent to negotiate surrender. During the negotiations, some of the invaders broke through the city walls and went on a rampage through the city. Incidentally, part of the city wall still stands today, not far from Christ Church Cathedral. Archbishop Lawrence returned into the city to absolve the dying, to comfort the sick, and to protect the churches from desecration. He encouraged Rory O'Connor, the High King, to gather his forces in order to expel the invaders. He enlisted the aid of Godfrey, the King of the Isle of Man, and of Askulf, chief of the Danish Ostem. Alas, O'Connor was too slothful and dilatory to do much, and he failed to expel the invaders. Matters took a more serious turn in 1171, with the arrival of forces under King Henry II himself. Incidentally, this is the same Henry II whose hands were already stained with the blood of St. Thomas a Becket. Henry landed in Waterford and eventually marched on Dublin. This arrival of the English king marked the beginning of 800 long years of English occupation of Ireland. The bishops, including Archbishop Lawrence and the chieftains, submitted to the English king. In 1175, O'Connor surrendered his claim to the Kingdom of Ireland and agreed to accept the Kingdom of Connacht as a fief from Henry II of England. Archbishop Lawrence was part of a delegation that went to London to negotiate the terms of the treaty, which was signed at Windsor in 1175. In 1179, Archbishop Lawrence led a group of Irish bishops in making the long and difficult journey to Rome to attend the Third Lateran Council that had been convened by Pope Alexander III. We should note that one of the many achievements of this council was the restoration of ecclesiastical discipline. Archbishop Lawrence himself played a prominent part in the proceedings of the council. Indeed, the Pope conferred on him the dignity of Apostolic Legate of Ireland. Archbishop Lawrence obtained from the Pope a bull defining the Archdiocese of Dublin 
and confirming his jurisdiction over the suffragan seas, including Glendalough. He also secured for the Irish Church recognition of its rights and independence, which it has never lost. Archbishop Lawrence returned to Ireland only to find that Rory O'Connor was again implicated in an attempt to throw off the authority of the English king, who in turn threatened to depose the old Irish king and to confiscate his territories. O'Connor asked Archbishop Lawrence to plead his case before the English king. When Archbishop Lawrence arrived in England, Henry refused to meet with him, departing instead for Normandy. Before he departed, the English king gave orders that Archbishop Lawrence was not to leave England. However, Archbishop Lawrence travelled to Dover and sailed to Normandy, landing at a port which still bears his name, St. Laurel. Alas, the Archbishop arrived in Normandy a very sick man, having caught a fever along the way. In Eu, he found shelter in a nearby monastery, and there he remained, being too ill to travel any longer. He sent a messenger to King Henry, telling him that he was dying, and to forgive the King of Connacht, and to receive him back into his favour. Henry was moved to grant the request. The news was brought back to Archbishop Lawrence, and he was able to die in peace. It was on the 14th of November, 1180, that he went on to his heavenly reward. In the year 1225, he was canonised by Pope Honorius III. The heart of St. Lawrence O'Toole was eventually preserved in Christ Church Cathedral in Dublin. Alas, it is a sign of the terrible times in which we now live that just a few years ago, thieves broke into the cathedral and stole this precious relic. Today, St. Lawrence O'Toole, together with St. Kevin, is venerated as patron of the Archdiocese of Dublin. The city of Dublin greatly needs their intercession. As we mentioned earlier, the See of Glendalough was united to the Archdiocese of Dublin in 1214. However, Glendalough is still used by the Church as a titular see, that is, a see for bishops who are not ordinaries of a diocese, such as auxiliary bishops and bishops in the Roman Curia. Indeed, the present Archbishop of Dublin was titular Bishop of Glendalough before his appointment to the See of Dublin. The Normans did their share of plunder in Ireland, and the monastic city of Glendalough was eventually destroyed by them. Other than a few intact buildings, it is mostly ruins to be found there today. But it is still well worth a visit. Spend the whole day there. We will close the programme with some words written by the writer, Gerald Griffin. Truly, the man is little to be envied whose piety grows not warmer as he treads the ruins of Glendalough. This episode of the History Programme was researched and presented by Frostalanus for Gate of Heaven Radio. We hope you have enjoyed it and will join us again next month for another episode of the History Programme. Ave Maria.